My name is Fidelma Fitzpatrick and I am a microbiologist and I'm here I suppose with my hat as the chair of our Irish sepsis steering group and in a way I feel like a fraud because in Ireland we're very much playing catch up with what you've been doing in the UK but nevertheless um, we're across the water from you and we have a slightly different healthcare system. So we have a mixed public and private healthcare system. So our public healthcare system is run by the Health Service Executive and that was formed in 2005. And in that every Irish citizen is entitled to a free hospital bed, but unlike in your case, a lot of our GPs are private practitioners, so they're, they, they get service level agreements to the HSE. And it's a bit like the NHS. In Ireland, the HSE has been reforming all the time since 2005. And the latest guys is we're now divided into five divisions, hospital, social care, mental health, health and well-being, and primary care. Um, and as a, when I'm working nationally, that makes things at times quite difficult because if you're trying to, like as Archie has quite rightly pointed out, people don't just plonk into the emergency department, they start off their story at home and in primary care and then the emergency department and then maybe they're transferred and then they go to another hospital. So to try and tell a story across all these divisions sometimes is, is, can be difficult. What they've done though in the last few years in Ireland is that they have seconded senior clinicians, Allegedly, I'm a senior clinician, I was a bit upset at that, um, into leadership roles to run national clinical programs. And some of the clinical programs are around diseases like diabetes, others are around areas like emergency care, primary care. And in my own case, the previous clinical program I led was prevention of healthcare associated infection, superbugs and not enough drugs. And as you could see with the previous program, I had to work across all these divisions. When we talk about sepsis in Ireland, and I mean nationally, so this isn't all the good work that's happened in the hospitals in the past. I suppose the first inkling of the word sepsis and what it really meant was an Irish boy, Rory, who died of sepsis. He had group A strep sepsis and he was living in New York with his parents and that certainly got a lot of publicity and actually his parents have turned into huge sepsis advocates, not only in North America but in the world. But really where all of Ireland knew what sepsis was, was unfortunately two years ago when a young lady who was pregnant died of E. coli sepsis. And certainly at the end of the public inquiry, everybody, the public and patients alike, knew what sepsis meant. And fast forward this lot, we're smiling at each other last November, that's our Minister for Health in the middle, our Chief Medical Officer and our um, Director General of the HSE. And that's because we launched our Irish guidelines in November last year. So as you can see, we're very much starting the so story nationally of sepsis in Ireland, really this year. So my talk is more about the national approach. It's not a talk on sepsis, because you know that, but it's just to share with you some of the challenges challenges we've come across so far, but we're only starting our story. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sepsis steering group, briefly touch on our guidelines, and then talk to you about five things I came across during this year, and I think we have to work on a lot um, in the next few years, and then finish off with where we're going next. Because as the chair of a group, you have to kind of point, I suppose, the team in the right direction, um, and you have to start somewhere. So I'm the chair of the National Ste Sepsis Steering Group and it was established in July 2013 and I don't have children but I understand what it's like to have children because I chair a group, multidisciplinary group of 33 people. So it can be interesting to say the least but it's very important. It, there is challenges when you have such a large group, large group but when you're starting from scratch it's much more important everybody's in the room because if everybody's in the room well then you can have a better dialogue. The most the most important person is Linda, our patient representative, and she's brilliant because when we're all losing the wood from the trees, she brings us back, as you have Archie, and said, look lads, we're not here to talk politics, we're here to save lives, can we get on with it? Um, we have people from hospital, pre-hospital and primary care because sepsis affects everybody. Um, we have the national clinical programmes, and that's very important because I'm a microbiologist, I know nothing about emergency medicine. So we have our emergency medical leads there, we have our acute medical leads. We've our pre-hospital care leads. 
Um, we have a junior doctor, because at the end of the day, it's all very well as a consultant for me to say do that, but thankfully, nobody's bleeping me at three in the morning. They're ringing me, but not bleeping me to get out of bed. We have a hospital manager. That's really important, I feel, because there's no point in talking about implementing when I don't have a budget. And hospital managers, like us all, we all speak a different language. And lastly, because I'm very clever, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. I did a, a fellowship in Scotland, so hence why we've got the Scottish sepsis lead, Kevin Rooney, on our group, because I liked their approach in Scotland. They went via very much a, a quality improvement approach. You can have all the national guidelines on the world, but until things Things come from the ground up as well, and implementation starts and ends there. It's not going to happen. And then one of my first jobs was to get a sepsis lead, because I can't be a sepsis lead. It's not my area of expertise. So Vida Hamilton, who is a force of nature, um, is our Irish sepsis lead, and she was appointed last year. So in terms of national sepsis in Ireland, we have a steering group, but really the work is going to be coordinated by Vida, and we'll support her. So what about the guidelines? Well, our wonderful minister kindly announced last December, the previous minister, that Ireland was going to produce sepsis guidelines. Now, I chaired the group and I was listening on the radio, so I was like, really? So we did produce sepsis guidelines, but what we did is we adopted the surviving sepsis guidelines. So they're the international guidelines. And the reason we adopted them is, in a way, it, it, it made them a little bit more user-friendly. And apologies, this doesn't project well. But what we did is we didn't change the essence of the recommendations, but we made them more or locally relevant. So for each recommendation we said who's responsible, what the recommendation is, and here's a bit of practical guidance. So in a way we kind of irish size them, because if you look at the surviving sepsis guidelines, it's a big academic document. So we took out the key recommendations and sort of made them a little bit relevant for us. But while we did breathe a sigh of relief and had a nice day out in November, guidelines are only the starting point. And I'm going to, in the next few s slides, talk about the whole issue of guidelines is until recently, certainly in Ireland, we felt the word implementation was, let's produce the guidelines and implementation just happens. It doesn't. So, in my own setting, because I'm a bug doctor, I was involved in both sets of Irish MRSA guidelines. And a, a year or two later, I surveyed my colleagues and asked, you know, how are you getting on with implementing it? And surprise, surprise, there was lots of challenges, a lot of which began with the or word, the resource word. But a lot of it was probably when we produced the guidelines, we didn't take account specifically of how these are going to be implemented. Outside the infection sphere, the Irish Stroke Guideline Group found the same thing that if you just produce guidelines, it's not good enough. And what are the challenges? Well, I think this is it. It's because up till recently, certainly in Ireland, a lot of, inf of, of attention has been at, let's have the guidelines done. We kind of have a little bit of about dissemination, which usually means they're published and emailed. And there's not a lot of thought about implementation. And this is relevant because for us in Ireland with sepsis, we felt that we had to start thinking about that. And we felt that in the past we thought about guideline implementation and it was all about knowledge. But anybody that's anyway human, look, we all know we should exercise more and not smoke and not drink. That's knowledge. Do we do it? We don't. We don't because that's attitude and behaviours and culture. And I know Martin Kiernan's probably going to address that later in the day in terms of, you know, how do you get implement implementation? It's not just knowledge. You have to t take account of social sciences. The other thing I was very cognizant of is we live in an age of information overload. And I love this quote from one of the patient bloggers. And he basically said, and it's not an excuse not to read journals, but if you read and memorized two medical journals articles every night, by the end of the year, you'd only be 400 years behind. And that really shows how life has moved on. So we can't ignore this when we're producing guidelines. So from the start with the Irish guidelines, Guidelines. We were very careful about thinking about dissemination. I'm not saying now we've got this perfect, by the way. And we did publish a nice document, and we did send the email. But we're very much conscious of having to follow it up again, again, and again. Because our aim is that everybody with sepsis in Ireland has a care pathway, no matter where they present. We look
looked to other countries, and we also looked at what they did in Australia. And you'll see in my talk, we talk about steps of six. I can't even remember six things. So I can only remember th three things. I talk about the three oars. And Archie, you actually really illustrated this beautifully, recognizing it. It was your GP that saw your low blood pressure. If he hadn't done that, your story may not have been so good. So it's recognizing it, resuscitate and refer, and in your case, to Alder Hay. So we've really adopted this as our mantra in Ireland, the three Rs. And we're supporting it with tools, education and audit. And at the start, we've started off in the hospitals because you have to start somewhere. But we're not ignoring pre-hospital care and primary care. So I said I'd talk about the few challenges, and I think this is their big challenge. I was on call a few weeks ago, and nobody rang me with the words, my patient has sepsis, I think the source is urine, or I think the source is chest. I got, he has septicemia. Really, how do you know that? He has no obvious source of sepsis, but you didn't tell me whether he's sepsis or not. He's septic, or he looks septic. I'm not sure how you can figure that one out. And he must have sepsis as he's gone off. Nobody said to me, this person has two or more SERS criteria. I suspect infection, therefore he has sepsis, and I need to do something, and I need your help. And I think it's speaking a common language. And it's to do, I suppose, with where you start. So when I was in medical school, I was taught a lot about bugs, and I was taught a lot about systems. But nobody really taught me about the language of sepsis. And so it's only in the last year or two that medical students in Ireland are beginning to be taught the language of sepsis. And I'll explain that in a minute. So because not everybody with an infection has sepsis. And not everybody with SIRS, which is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, has sepsis either. So when we're talking about sepsis, we're talking about where people have SIRS and infection is suspected or confirmed. And that's the thing we're trying to drive home. And I use an example of, if I run up the stairs, there's a good chance I'll have some SERS criteria. I'll have an elevated heart rate, I'll probably have a temperature, and by God, I don't know what's gonna to happen to my blood pressure. That's our, my body's response, that's not sepsis. So we worked on some common definitions and stride, tried to strip them back bare. The advantage of having a chair of a, of a steering group that's a bit on the basic side and normal is that everything is a bit tabloid and easy to learn. So we said SERS is a clinical response. Sepsis is SERS plus infection. And septic shock, you can only diagnose that if you give fluid and it's failed to resuscitate the patient. So these are the next few slides are the kind of slides we've been using in education. And we've said that when you talk about infection, any bug can cause infection. Um, and actually, you can have an infection without having, in Archie's case, positive bugs and finding the name and address of the bug. So you, an infection is a pathological process. Whereas SIRS is a clinical response, it's what the patient mounts, and we can have the infectious causes and the non-infectious causes, and these are the modified SIRS, and Archie, you illustrated the blood glucose point of this. So when somebody has SIRS, which is the way your body defends itself, you, they usually have a temperature, a high heart rate, high respiratory rate, white cells go up, blood glucose probably goes up, and certainly in older people, you get an altered mental status. The maladaptive part of this is when your temperature, you can't mount a temperature or a white cell re response. So then sepsis is SIRS and infection. And how we relate that to is the common sources of sepsis. Now, this is actually information from a point prevalence survey that was done recently, I think in Australia, in emergency departments and critical care. So these were sources of sepsis and severe sepsis. And it's no surprise if anybody's ever worked in an emergency department, these are really the top three, and probably skin and soft tissue after that will be the big causes of infection. Severe sepsis is when you have this complicated by organ dysfunction, and then septic shock. And we've tried to get this point across despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So you'll see later on when I share with you our algorithms, which are the surviving sepsis algorithms. We've put a big emphasis on recognize and resuscitate, and fluid is part of that resuscitate. So that's my aim. I want, in the next month or two, when I'm on call, somebody to ring me and say, I need to talk to you, my patient has sepsis. 
The second thing we had to do, certainly in Ireland, was to establish the burden. Because even if we're all speaking the same language, you need to know where you're starting from before you can try and improve. So certainly in terms of burden, I believe in this. Because whether you're religious or not, nobody will believe anything unless you've data. And anyway, if you don't have data, you don't know whether you're getting better or worse. And the bottom line is sepsis is common and kills. And it's really on a par in terms of incidence with acute myocardial infarction. And mortality rates between 20 and 50% have been described. Most of them around the 20%. The, it's a Brazilian study that had the 50%. So when we look at mortality in sepsis, that's very similar to what acute myocardial infarction was in the 1960s. And look how good we've got at treating heart attacks. That's where we want to go with sepsis. I've been reliably told that's Anfield. Don't shoot me if it's wrong. I know nothing about football. And this is from the UK Sepsis Trust, which has fantastic resources and really has led the way in, in England and the rest of the UK. Look at the amount of deaths from sepsis in the UK. Think about the amount of money and publicity that the other cancers, quite rightly by the way, have got. So we need to start working on sepsis with this approach. So let's say some Irish data. Well, we went to HYPE, which is our hospital inpatient inquiry. So if I have a patient in hospital and they're discharged, the discharges are coded with HYPE codes. So it was quite interesting that the coding was pretty crap, to say the least. But that's, of course, because we weren't speaking the language of sepsis. So only about 16% of discharges had a code of sepsis only. When we broadened it out to say sepsis and or infection, there was 60%. But remember, the truth is probably in between because not everybody with infection has sepsis. In 2013, of those with sepsis, so bear in mind that that's an underestimate, there was about 9,000 patients. And that represented a quarter of a million bed days. Think about all the beds we could free up. In Ireland, we have a problem with trolleys in our emergency department and hospital capacity. Isn't that, wouldn't that be amazing if we could free that up? And in terms of in-hospital mortality, about 28%. But bearing in mind, this is all baseline figures with probably more caveats. But at the end of the day, you're better off having some data than no data. And we don't have time to wait for perfect data. We have to get on with it. The reality of sepsis, ALOS is average length of stay. And the bottom line of this slide is no matter where we looked for that in Ireland, if you have sepsis, you end up staying in hospital longer. I know that's really obvious, but believe me, unless I show some people this data, they're not going to believe it. We also submit data to the OECD and have done so for years in Ireland, as have the UK countries. Now, they classified as medical and surgical septic shock. But the bottom line is certainly what is seen here in Ireland, the trends going up is seen internationally. And this probably not, doesn't reflect an epidemic of sepsis. What it reflects is probably a mixture of antibiotic resistance, much more vulnerable patients, and the fact that we're getting better at treating vulnerable people and we've a lot of immunosuppression. And there's probably a bit of an increase in awareness. And this is the last Irish slide. And I, I think this is important to start looking at data. So I think the truth is in between both of these figures because this is an overestimate. So certainly sepsis represents a very significant number of inpatient cases in Ireland and represents a lot of bed days. Probably not the 42% because that includes infection. So after we've established the burden, we're very keen in Ireland to try and establish some costs because unless you've been under a stone recently, you probably know that the Celtic tiger is now dead. So we don't have a lot of money in Ireland. So we're very, you know, healthcare is costly and it beholds us all in Ireland to use our money wisely. And certainly in the UK, you've given certainly good baseline um, estimates for us in Ireland, but we need to get our own figures. But there's also the human cost. And that's why I think it's important that Archie and people that have had survived sepsis tell their story. Because it's all very well to look at all this amount of money. That's meaningless. 
because the human cost is the psychological trauma when you go home and have to get better and get back to your normal life. And also in older people, things like cognitive impairment. So this is more described in older people, but that either have dementia um, or, or, or have mild cognitive impairment. But certainly after sepsis, their cognitive impairment gets worse. So there's a human cost. So for all the blather, as they say, about figures and money, at the end of the day, any of us could get sepsis. None of us are immune. So once we speak a common language and get bottom line figures to try and improve on, I think the message then has to get out, and you've worked a lot in the UK on this, that sepsis is a time dependent medical emergency. We should respond to sepsis the same way we respond to MIs. And until you have that language of sepsis, that's not going to happen. So we've looked at what the Australians have done, and certainly they're the ones that came up with the three Rs. And they found the probably very obvious thing, that if you don't recognize sepsis fast, you don't do well. Or rather, if you recognize it fast, you do much better. And this is why. This is a much quoted slide from Kumar. And the bottom line is, for every hour you delay your antibiotics, there is a 7% or so increase in mortality. And that's where we've come up with the golden hour of sepsis. The sooner you get antibiotics in to kill the bugs, the better. And it's evidence-based, as well as common sense. The other thing we're trying to do with the sepsis steering group is make it easy to, do, to diagnose sepsis and do the right thing. Because again, we are all human in healthcare, and mistakes will happen. But we have to make sure our systems are robust to support us to do the right thing. So how are we doing this? Well, it'd be much easier if Archie could have had a tattoo and gone, yoy, I've got sepsis, do something. But people don't present with tattoos. And it's been very well described, unfortunately. And sure, Machiavelli saw this himself. And he said, as the physician says it happens in fever, that in the beginning of the malady, it's easy to cure, but difficult to detect. But in the course of time, not having been either detected or treated in the beginning, it becomes easy to detect, but difficult to cure, i.e. recognition fast. But diagnosing sepsis can be difficult. It'd be very easy if people came with tattoos or very classic symptoms, because not all patients have these classic SIRS responses. Because we, certainly in adult hospitals, we look after a whole gamut of patients who are immunosuppressed for a number of reasons, specifically elderly patients. And elderly patients over 65 are a huge cohort, certainly in the hospital I work, of people that come in with infection. And in elderly people, sometimes a fall because of, a, of confusion is the only symptom. So while we're sending Sending our education down the SIRS route, we're also saying to everybody, you have to use a bit of common sense. If somebody looks as if clinically they have an infection and they don't tick all the boxes, you still manage the patient. As they say, don't just tick the box and miss the point, manage the patient. So the three O's are what we're trying to do. Early recognition and to support people to do that appropriate intervention, resuscitation, and Vida's doing a lot of work with her colleagues in terms of trying to simplify fluid resuscitation protocols. It's not my area of, of, of expertise, but even with all the various studies that have been published recently, the bottom line is you get in fluid fast. An appropriate referral to crit critical care. So what we've done in Ireland is we've started with the hospital patients, because you have to start somewhere, and we've divided our hospital patients into inpatients and emergency patients. We're working with the paediatric program to try and make sure that that's adaptable for paediatrics, because a paediatric starts with very wee little neolates and ends up with, with young adults. So paediatrics is a, a different specialty. Um, but basically, the, the spectrum of sepsis is different in the emergency department and in the inpatient wards for adults, certainly. About 2% about of 
all emergency department referrals are because of sepsis. So it's common, but it's certainly not as common as on the wards. So you've got a national early warning score, so do we, so do they have in New South Wales. And between 30 to 50% of early warning score triggers are due to sepsis. So it's much more common on the wards. And the other thing is there is a big difference difference in terms of the types of infections and bugs and the specialism between the emergency department and the ward. And as you've seen by the way I'm going, I'm going to present very different approaches. And we've worked with both the emergency programme and the acute medical programme to make sure we're right. So in the emergency department, like Archie, it's a community acquired bug. You got it out in the community. So it's probably going to be something that's readily treatable, hopefully, with first line antibiotics. Usually people present with less comorbidities than their inpatient cohort, but not necessarily. Emergency department doctors and nurses and, and other clinicians have generalised training, so they're well equipped to deal with what's coming in. And we've described that mortality about 20%, but I've said in some studies it's up to 50%. Adult wards are a whole different beast, because when people get infection on wards, it's often hospital acquired and often antibiotic resistant. They often have comorbidities, and even if they didn't, sepsis is usually the second hit. So by that I mean they might have had come in very healthy, had surgery, and now develop post-op sepsis. So that's your second hit. It's like the dominoes. A lot of the time they're seen by staff with specialised training. So the best example of that might be in the maternity hospitals. So most obstetricians do not see pregnant women with sepsis, thankfully, because most pregnant women don't have sepsis. So it's not a common event. Likewise, in some of the very specialist surgical hospitals, again, sepsis is not a common event. So we can't use the same approach for the emergency department as we can on the wards. So what have we done? We've said that recognize it, and I'll show you the two pathways, and then you have to do six and 60 which is sepsis six. Now I told you at the start I couldn't figure out anything beyond three. So I've divided it into three because I'm a bit thick at times. And I said, well, you have to take three and give three. And I think this is a really simple way, certainly for me, of remembering sepsis six. So the IV antibiotics is essentially a very important part of that, as is IV fluid. And then taking your blood cultures beforehand. Now, you're not going to be able to see these, but this is just an example of the emergency department pathway. And what we've done is, with our ED docs, we asked them, when do you think we should be diagnosing sepsis? And they said, well, do in triage. So we linked it with the Manchester triage system, because that has to be done within 15 minutes of somebody arriving, no matter who they are. And we said, if there's a suspected or confirmed infection, and if they have SIRS criteria, you stratify them depending on their blood pressure and lactate. And if their blood pressure is lower or their lactate's high, they're referred immediately to resus down one pathway, and if not, down the other. This is the pathway. I'm not saying it's implemented in every emergency department because all of this is going to have a lot of cultural and practice change because triage is busy. The last thing they need is another pretty pathway. So we're working with them and asking them, them being the emergency departments, which are not a homogenous group, what works in your hospital? Well, if it works in your hospital that way, do it. If it works in your hospital that way, do it. Who cares once we recognise the patients with sepsis? In the inpatients, because we have a national early warning score and it's in and all the wards, we start it there. Again, you can still have patients with sepsis that don't tick the box, but most people do. So we've set at a certain trigger you need to recognise and do your sepsis six. So that's how we're going to link it. We have a group looking at um, that has a maternity early warning score and also a paediatric early warning score. And that's the approach we're going to take for that. Pre-hospital care and primary care, we haven't gone there yet, but we're going to again take the same approach of asking those that work in those settings what they think feels best, because I fundamentally believe it's the only way to get anything done. So this is our inpatient algorithm, and it looks different to the emergency department algorithm, and it's meant to because they're two different beasts, but we've basically linked it. So detection with the early warning score, once you diagnose sepsis, 6 and 60, and if they haven't um, improved after their fluid resuscitation, that septic shock, then you get critical care involved. And even I know that. Now, because I'm a microbiologist, and 
antibiotic stewardship is also important. One of the risks of approaching let's get the antibiotic fast in fast is we could end up with antibiotics flying all over the place. And we have care bundles, so it's a matter of making sure everything's connected. So we've linked our sepsis approach for antibiotics with our start smart and then focus care bundle, because it's important to start smart, because there's a big increase in mortality if you're put on the wrong antibiotics. So why do we bother doing all this? Well, we bother because there's evidence from your country and from every other country that if you recognize and do your six and 60 fast, it saves lives and reduces mortality. And that's just one quote from a journal, but there's multiple examples. And that's just a different way of looking at it. Compliance goes up, mortality goes down. I like this because I'm simple. But that isn't it, because when we're talking about sepsis 6, it's only a minimal intervention, because sepsis is a continuum. People may present with sepsis, develop severe sepsis and septic shock. If you see somebody, for example, in the emergency department, and they're not very unstable, you can't just walk away. You need to build in a sort of a feedback loop that they're constantly assessed. And source control, there's no point in sticking all the antibiotics in the world if somebody's got a big abscess. And then the last thing just to share with you, but again, you've already done this. What we're doing in Ireland is making tools readily available. Now, we don't have, even though we all have smart iPhones and we're all on Twitter and all of that, our hospital IT systems in general are kind of creaking. Like our laboratory system is DOS-based. I don't even know what that means, only it was there when I was a junior doctor. So within the confines of that, we're trying to make tools readily available. So we've established a website. It's not brilliant, it's not perfect, but you know what, it's better than nothing. And we're gonna try and get all our tools up there. And Vida has recorded a video. And we're, we're also working with our patient groups and the National Adult Literacy um, unit on developing a patient information leaflet so that actually down the line patients that get sepsis will know what sepsis is and know when they should get help and also because healthcare is meant to be a partnership and patients helping us of course there's going to be barriers with the best will in the world and there's only four and a half million population in ireland it's difficult to make sure everybody knows about, about what we're doing. Lack of agreement, I give up. After 33 people on the committee, I think we should hopefully not get the lack of agreement. But we're trying to kind of address some of these with, with data, with tools to make it easy to do the right thing, but also to balance that top-down and bottom-up approach because too much top-down doesn't work. We all know that. And there's plenty of external barriers. And do you know what? Sometimes we have to accept that we're never always going to get it right with guidelines and tools, because that's the art of medicine as well as the science of medicine. We're going to try and address it certainly in the first year or two with education, audit, but audit linked to quality improvement. We're going to try and improve our hype codes as well so that our data is more accurate. But at the end of the line, this is kind of a two-woman show and we probably do, we are fighting, but we do need to get more resources certainly in Ireland because no matter how dynamic myself and Vida are, you can only do a certain amount. So. Educational tools is what we're trying to develop. We're trying to develop an app. The Scots have, a, have an app, I think you have one in England, and there's certainly a really good one in Wales that links the early warning score to sepsis screening. Because I don't know about you, but I can't count at four in the morning. So why should the junior doctors or the nurses on the wards be any different? We're going to develop e-learning as a supplement. E-learning isn't ever a replacement for face-to-face -face education. And do some videos as well. Um, Vida is doing a one-woman show around the hospitals, meeting people face-to-face. -face. It's probably a little bit different in England because you have a bigger country, but Ireland's small. The way you do business in Ireland is face-to-face -face and getting to know people and and hear their side of the story. Patient education and awareness is very, very important because you also have to balance it right because you want to make sure that people get accurate information and know what sepsis is, know when they need to get help. We're actually going to have a sepsis summit. Sounds very grand, but our Minister for Health is coming this July. And we're going to get our senior clinicians and our senior managers 
at that summit because we want to raise awareness and start speaking that language of sepsis. I know you've already done that in England, but we're only starting, so we have to go start somewhere. And we do need better data. We need to get better coding so that we can get some more accurate information. And we're going to try and monitor progress. And whether you like it or not, you do have to set some sort of national steer as to where you want to see things going. So we're going to target looking at incidence of sepsis per the 100,000 population and mortality from sepsis and severe sepsis. So I suppose in summary, the focus of the Irish programme has to be pragmatism because we've we're in a way forced to do the guidelines, but it's a good thing. But now we're only starting. And we're working with the clinical programs and patients, and more importantly, hospitals in the first instance on the ground to try and actually move these tools from things on the beautiful website um, to, to things that can be implemented. And before, I want to show you a video because I think it's appropriate we finish with this video. We've started with Archie's story. Um, I just want to thank Vida and Ron Daniels and the UK Sepsis Trust and Kevin Rooney because as a humble microbiologist, I've had a huge education in the world of sepsis and I couldn't have done it without it. The reason I want to show you this video is Rory Staunton's parents set up the Rory Staunton Foundation and they have been huge advocates of sepsis and sepsis recognition in North America but also worldwide and one of their wishes was in Ireland we'd ever get our act together so I hope we're at the start of, of telling that story for them. I think you've a really exciting opportunity today when you talk about industry and academia and the NHS. If you guys can't figure it out for, for your area of the world, I, 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 don't th I think it's going to be really exciting today. Thank you very much.